to the Dual Access Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Kriebel. I'm the global head coach of the Data School, and I created this podcast to help introduce you to interesting people in the world of data. Today, I'm talking with someone who's helped more than 2.2 million people learn about data science. I can't imagine there's anybody else in the world that's helped more. Carol Aramenko is the founder of Super Data Science, an online learning platform to help anyone get started in a career in data science and AI. Thanks for joining me, Carol. Hey, Andy, it's good to see you again. It's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah, I think the, the first time we saw each other in person was at DSGO, which was, uh, uh, what, back in 2016? 2017, 2017 yeah, yeah. In, in San Diego. So it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Great, it's great to talk to you again. I hope, yeah. I hope you've been doing well. And you look quite different without a beard. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah. That's great. I've decided to, to um, you know, change up my uh, style a little bit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> you probably feel lighter as well. Yeah. And cooler. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, um, yeah, let's just, let's just hop right into it. I've got a lot of really, um, hopefully thought provoking questions for you. Uh, I'm really interested in learning more about uh, how you got into data science, uh, super data science itself, how people can learn all the different things and the ways that you've helped people. And then maybe we'll talk about what's next. Cause I don't know what you, you know, I'm sure you have to something. So let's, let's uh, chat about that as well. When I was researching you, I looked at your background on LinkedIn and I was expecting to see lots of things, computer science, math, something like that. But I don't see a traditional kind of data science educational background. So it's, how did how did you get started in data science? It's interesting. Interesting that because um, like you you came onto the Super Data Science podcast when I was a host, like two, two or three times. And so now the tables have turned. I used to research <laughs> your background and like you know, how you moved to America and how you moved back to, no, sorry, how then you moved to the UK and so on. Yeah, and yeah. So lots of your interesting background. Um, but yeah, so in short, you're right. I, I never studied computer science as a degree. I do have a bachelor's degree in applied physics and mathematics. So I got quite okay. deep into um, nanotechnology, laser physics back in the time and really loved it. Uh, but then I... I realized there's not uh, you know much future for me in academia because you have to go, go like a narrow focus you know when you're doing a PhD after now I like I like breadth is it and much so more I'm, like research oriented than once you get to the the kind of next level yeah, yeah, yeah. and, and maybe yeah. a, become a professor or something like that yeah exactly and you have to like pick I had to pick like nanotechnology or laser physics or whatever I was going to pick but I like all of it yeah um, and uh, yeah so then I uh, moved to Australia and did. Uh, a master's in phys sorry accounting and finance so got that like business aspect and even though it's not directly related to data science the way that we think of it as machine learning it was a really good um like foundation in terms of business knowledge and domain knowledge that would later serve its role and uh, you know through luck and chance i got a uh, internship and then later a job at Deloitte where I happened to end up in the data science division. And that's how I learned, you know, to put all my background together to make a data science. And they really helped coach me. Deloitte Australia really helped to coach me to you know, like to get the basics of, you know, SQL, Tableau, um, Excel, all those other tools, even uh, SSIS services, how to mm -hmm. uh, e do ETL traction from load because, you know, consulting services have very rigorous pipelines and so on. Um, so, yeah, that's how I got into it and loved it. And uh, I did a, another year after Deloitte. I did two years at Deloitte and another year at a, a pension fund in Australia where I realized, uh, like, I was building up a data science division from scratch. It was just me and another person. And then I realized that, like, I want to teach this. And that's how I got into um, you know, Udemy and teaching uh, super data science and so on. So that's a, in a in a quick recap. Yeah. Does it ever kind of blow your mind how many people you've helped? <laughs> it does. It does. But for for the record, I want to uh, like clearly uh, for everybody say out there that I I try never to claim the two point two million because of course a huge part of that is Udemy's you know marketing, but yeah. also the statistics are quite sad. Like so many people sign up two point two million, but only about 10% of people ever start a course. So technically, you know, like okay. if, if 200,000 people have heard my voice on in a course kind of a scenario, like let that's alone a lot. podcast, it's a lot already, you know, I'm very grateful for that. And that's uh, um, like, even I think if, even if you're in your life, you can help one person, you know, you're already mm -hmm. a success. 
Yeah. Yeah. We're, we, our 37th cohort at the data school started this week and we have wow. eight, eight per we're cohort. Still doing that. So, so many years uh, later. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we've, I think we're close to 20 now in Australia and we've got two in New wow. York, four in Hamburg. Wow. So it's, Congrats. yeah, so we're seeing Congrats. a lot of that, that same kind of growth, um, except we don't have a 10% drop off. So <laughs> no, that's, that's, that's really fantastic. I like it's yeah. in person and I love how you do the, the placements, you know, you're still doing those like placements. Yeah. Companies? Yeah. Four, four, yeah. six month placements after they go through the training program. That's awesome. And, and uh, I mean, the jobs people are getting coming out now are just incredible. Yeah. Um, that's you know, so that, cool. and what's really neat is we're now seeing because people have left several years ago, they've now been in their companies for several years and they're yeah. now hiring managers. Yeah. And this is one of the things we sort of thought about when we first set up the data school was, wouldn't it be great yeah. if we train these people, they do their placements, they go become managers in their roles and guess where they're going to look when they need people yeah, to hire. Back to you. Yeah. Exactly. Right back to us. And it's, it's really, really fun to see that. And we get, to, we had Christmas drinks the other night and it was great seeing a lot of the alumni again. And we were building this big alumni network. Um, the challenge so we have cool. now is that there's so many people that we're trying to figure out ways to bring the alumni closer to the people that are in training now. And it's just yeah. tough because, you know, if you were in DS3 and now you're yeah. meeting people from DS37, it just kind of is like, oh, how am I supposed to get to know all these people? So that's our, <laughs> that's our current challenge right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. That's really cool, cool that you're still doing that. that yeah. Project. It's really exciting. Because I, I interviewed one of your um, students at the time on the podcast. I, I forget her name, unfortunately. but um, And she was saying such great things. And so, so she was so excited about her placement. I think she was like into her second or third month. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was really cool to hear. I'm trying to remember who that is. That's going to drive me crazy now because I can't. <laughs> I can't look it up later, okay. we'll, we'll think of it right at the very end, I bet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. probably. Great. Yeah. How did you start? So you started super data science right away after you, when you had this thought that you wanted to start teaching people, is that when you set up super data science? Um, no, actually not, not really. Like it's, it was a funny um, story. Like I was, I was learning, I needed to learn um, uh, JavaScript. And so I went on Udemy and I was learning online myself. And then um, through that, like through the instructor's motivation, I realized he actually gave the hint that you can also teach online. So I decided to try it. And um, at first, actually, I was teaching courses on uh, foreign exchange trading because that was my hobby back in the day, a long time ago. Okay. And I thought, hey, you know, like I'll teach how to program in that space and so on. So I released a few courses in that. And then Udemy actually contacted me and said, hey, do you know anything else? Uh, like your teaching style is quite good. I guess that's what they were thinking. And uh, <laughs> I like to tell myself that. And I said, hey, yeah, data science, that's what I do for I my day job. And they're like, oh, yeah, you should try that. So I started teaching. And Super Data Science was just like a, more of like, well, I'm teaching on Udemy anyway. Might as well create additional materials and start creating like a community or maybe like some community in the future to, to have the students that like the courses to come to Super Data Science as well. And like because there were so many students taking the courses on Udemy, a lot of them came to Super Data Science. And I thought, oh, wow, like maybe we can offer something uh, different like on Udemy you buy a course you know one off and you can get any of our yeah. courses there but on Super Data Science you can like pay a subscription and get access to all the courses and take the ones you want in mm -hmm. whatever order and however you like and you know we had um, like the we started I started the podcast which I was very like passionate about and I'm excited that you're starting a podcast now that is so cool it's long <laughs> it's really fun long time coming. it's a great learning experience yeah I can imagine yeah yeah so yeah that's how Super Data Science started I think it was 20, oh, I forget, 2015 or 17. So it's been a while since yeah. it's supposed to be running. How do you differentiate yourself from all the other courses in Udemy, though? Let's just focus um, on Udemy for now, because there's so many courses, like let's just just say Tableau. There's, yeah. I don't even know how many there are. There's tons of courses. So how do they decide, how would you recommend somebody decide which instructor is the right one for them? Oh, that's a good question. There are indeed lots of courses and um, there's been a big uh, inflow of instructors in the past few years uh, as online education has grown, as data science and data analytics ha have, uh, have grown. Um, like, I think people should learn from those who inspire them and those who they find engaging and exciting. It's not always for everybody going to be the same person. Like, I completely appreciate that 
there are other instructors that are a better match for some students that like than me um i can say about my style that i often am not an expert in something that i'm teaching i'm teaching something because i'm like i know some foundations and then i'm very curious about this thing and so i go in like and i dig and i get i go under every stone so creating a course for me takes a long time mm. but like i don't like i'm i don't feel internally satisfied if i don't know something why it's happening a certain way or why you need to be doing this this way and so through that process of discovery uh, i kind of like i'm learning for the first time so i know what the pitfalls are for somebody else who will be learning the first time so mm -hmm. i and then right away like i'm i'm creating the course as i'm learning i'm creating the course or as i'm refreshing my knowledge if i already knew some of the things but often it's something i brand new i'm learning so um in that sense like i feel it's an advantage actually and for those listening if somebody wants to teach it's an advantage not to be an expert in a field but to be learning because as you're learning you are closer to those who will be following in your footsteps and you you can help them learn better so i think that's one of the advantages of like of one of the distinguishing characteristics of my teaching style um and the other one i would say is like i like to make my courses engaging you know like i've i've seen too many courses where uh, or being in lectures where it's like really boring or like the data sets are overused <laughs> data sets, you know, like the Virginica Satosa, those kind of things, or the Titanic data set, you know, they're nice data sets, but like you can't just keep using them. I like, I like to create new data sets. I like, I like to make my courses like a Netflix show kind of thing, you know, like watch it. Uh, and then you get like a cliffhanger at the end of the episode. So yeah. it makes you go to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So I, I like to make it fun. Um, that's what I, that's what I would say. So I, I think for those out there, um, there is a lot of choice. Try a few courses, see what um, what you resonate with, and then try to stick stick at least go through one course with that instructor. You know, because uh, then you will know if that's the right person for you. Yeah, there's the old adage that the teacher learns more than the students, and I know from from my experience <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Every time yeah, I yeah. teach, I learn something new. So I'm the exactly. one that gets to learn the most, which is really yeah. fun. So, and then I, and I love those add on to other people. I know. And like, I used to dread like questions on web live webinars and so on when people ask you and you're like, what if I don't know the answer? But now like, I love those kind of questions because it's like, well, I don't know the answer. I'm not, you yeah. know, like I'm not perfect and that's okay. I can't answer it right now, but I'll definitely get back to you afterwards because I'm curious now how to sort of, like I was running a webinar actually on Tableau a few months ago. Um, I took a break for a few years and then this was my first webinar after I think two years. And somebody asked me a question how to like do this dynamic parameter thing to put it into this. Um, I don't even remember what it was through, through LOD expressions, like, it's like yeah. boom. And then at the end of the webinar, we had like 10 minutes. So I like, we were digging through it and, and we got it to the end of it. It's like a good feeling, you know, when you learn something like that. Yeah. What do you think the primary benefits are for people that decide to go through or subscribe to super data science? Um, okay. Well, wow. Um, Good question. So what the primary benefits are? Well, of course, you learn. Um, um, like the, I guess the primary benefit would be if you like the teaching style that Adlan and I have and, you know, you like the courses that we have um, and you don't want to keep purchasing them on Udemy separately, you can subscribe um, uh, to Super Data Science. I would say, like, at this stage, um, we're not like focusing on growing super data science hugely. So it's more of a, like an, a resource for those who want to join in. Just like we don't have the capacity. We're working on a uh, very interesting other project, unfortunately, which I can't go into detail. I know you asked like what we're doing next, but this is a project that we're running in Incognito and we'll be launching probably in, in March next year. So people can hang, uh, stay tuned for that. But There's so like right now... Hanger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so right now we don't unfortunately have all the time to, you know, go out there and aggressively market super data science. So I would just advise, like, if somebody wants to learn some one thing from us, then please take a course on Udemy. If you want to subscribe on super data science, if you feel like you want to, like, learn a few from a few courses, please feel free to do that. Uh, we're happy to, you know, help you either way. Uh, that's that's you know that's my motto. <laughs> What are all the different types of learning they can do on super data science? I know there's Tableau, but there's yeah. this whole field of data science. You've got SQL courses. Yeah, yeah. Um, what's the kind of the breadth of, of things people can learn? Well, um, if uh, somebody doesn't know my uh, 
good co-instructor and good friend is Adlan de Ponteves. And uh, we uh, literally, I think, went through all possible areas of data science in the past, you know, since 2016 that we recorded courses. We are lo- like, we have a total of, I think, over 100 courses that include translations, include co-instructors mm. and so on. But the courses that we record ourselves, I think there's like several dozen. And we've gone through machine learning, data science, R, Python, uh, deep learning, AI, um, another like uh, like a reinforcement learning course, deep, deep reinforcement learning courses, I remember, computer vision course, natural language processing course, um, like any area of data science, even blockchain, we even created a course on blockchain because we were curious about it and also it was um, the hype in 2017. So pretty much any area of data science, I would say, oh, and also Tableau, Power BI, all the visualization areas of data science, um, like we, we have it covered and um, yeah, so anything that interests you is something you can dive in. Okay. So you've got the whole data preparation, data engineering piece. You've got the data visualization piece and the analysis piece. You've got the reporting. You've got kind of the whole gamut of, of things that people can learn. I would say so. I'm not 100% sure about data engineering. You've mentioned it. Uh, possibly it's part of the collection in Super Data Science. Uh, I didn't personally record a course on that, but maybe a constructor did. But you can always yeah. go and uh, search the courses on Super Data Science. And I think there's a, yeah. a free trial, like a free trial, which allows you to access some of the content or for a limited time. So you can always check that out as well. Mm-hmm. Mm. Ooh, I just could I, could I, like, could I do a shameless promotion apart from Super Absolutely. Data Science? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would highly recommend something I really, of course, I believe in Super Data Science and I, I think people you know, should check it out. And also, of course, but I highly recommend checking out the book that, I wrote Confident Data Skills, uh, second edition. You can get on Amazon. Um, this one was updated. I remember the first the, edition. I thank you. You you um, you wrote, uh, and you are still here on the back. Andy oh Grebel. Uh, <laughs> yeah, here you you wrote yeah. a testimonial. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. So like, I just really believe in the book. I put a lot of effort in, it and I think, and I, the, my goal with the book was to write a book that people can read on the train. You know, look at all of data mm. science books, you have to um, sit in front of a computer and be coding in Python or in R right. or like be referencing materials or doing vis- visualization. This book is just like a book for everybody about data science. And like, I'm really passionate about it. It's, I think it's been translated into three languages now, which is very exciting. Oh, cool. I can't claim that I've sold millions of copies or anything. I think I've sold a few thousand copies, but anybody who can get their hands on, I, I think it's an exciting read because I put in a lot of like case studies, you know, like mm. uh, just really fun, like a winemaker case study or that time when the police called me about my motorbike and like how that relates <laughs> to Bayesian statistics and all that breathalyzer tests and all that. Like I really find like applied data science can be a lot of fun. And mm. I think that book illustrates it. So yeah. <laughs> apologies for the shameless self-promotion, but I think uh, it's it's a book worth worth checking out. Well, it, the book makes it very relate makes data science very relatable to people. If you if because yeah. you talk through case studies and specific examples, people are like, oh, okay, that's what data science means. That's where it comes in, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Do you have any students that have gone through that have gotten maybe big promotions or any um, any outcomes that you know are from your courses that you can point to to say this is what people can get out of it? Uh, yeah, we have plenty of those. I, I, it's hard to name them off the top of my head, but uh, um, even on the podcast, I would often interview people who um, uh, would have gone through similar situations. I can get, give you one example, Nick Cepeda. He was in, uh, yeah, I Nick, think, I, one... I remember meeting him at Super Dave at the... At the yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he, he used to work in the military. He had some rudimentary uh, skills in SQL, and then uh, through... Uh, so I, I, as I understand, and as I remember from uh, his the conversation with him, through the courses that he was learning with us, and through the podcast, um, he was able to get eventually a job at Disney as a, yeah. I think, a data analyst, and then mm-hmm. get, I think, promoted there, and then he went off and started his own startup. So yeah, so that's just one example, and um, like I, I've heard lots of stories. I just can't name the people off the top of my head, but I recommend people checking out. Uh, the Super Data Science podcast. And like I was listening because right now there's a different host. There's uh, John Crone. So I passed mm-hmm. that podcast on to him uh, almost two years ago. And I was like listening to an episode myself uh, just driving today. And again, there was a guest. Um, I forgot the name. Uh, I forgot their name. But uh, he uh, he was like two years ago, he started in data science. He was listening to the podcast. Mm. 
And now he's got his own YouTube channel with like millions of views and he's pe teaching people data science. Yeah. So I think it's a, a lot what I like about data, data science in general is like it's an, it's a friendly time, friendly and welcoming community. So like a lot of people that have, we've helped through our courses or indirectly through the podcast somehow have uh, moved on and now are helping other people. So it's always nice to see. Mm. If you are a newbie getting started in super in, uh, in data science yeah. and you say, Hey, I've heard of this great course called super data science. Where do you mm -hmm. start? Do you have well, some kind of learning journey for people? We have some learning paths, um, uh, we've, which we've had for a while and you, uh, you can find them on super data science. Um, but, I would say we just, the good news is that Adlan and I just literally released our first course that in two years is called Machine Learning in Python Level 1, which you can find on Super Data Science or on Udemy. And um, that course is uh, like is like an, a new new style for us because, like as I mentioned, we were away. Um, Adlan was doing movies. I was doing some, some business ventures and some other things, uh, exploring like my creative side. But for two years, and then we came back and we decided to reinvent our teaching style. And we looked at like what's happening in the world of online education. One thing mm -hmm. we noticed is that attention spans have gone down, like like prevalently or uh, per per pervasively across the world. People don't want 20 or 15 minute lectures anymore. And you, you probably know this from your own experience, yeah. right? Like people want short, brief, to the point. And our courses before, which we launched in like 2016, 17, uh, often they like there's a lecture that goes off on a tangent and it's on 12, 15 minute long. And like the course is great, but they are these long lectures from time to time. And before it was amazing. Now people, you know, like fast forward through them and skip through them sometimes. What we did in this course is like it's a three and a half hour course uh, that teaches you uh, regression, classification and clustering. All the foundations plus, you know, things like. Uh, R squared, adjusted R squared, the confusion matrix, accuracy ratios, and so on—all the stuff you need as a starting data scientist—and it does it in a, like in a in a beginner-friendly way, in an mm. applied way, in a fun way. But also, the lectures are short, so we like have three, four, six-minute lectures. So, um, to uh, get to the point, I would recommend anybody who wants to get their foundations in data science or refresh their foundations in data science. Uh, check out that course, Machine Learning in Python, uh, level, level one. Yeah. I know for me, because of that same issue with attention spans going down, my tutorial videos, I've tried to make shorter and shorter. And mm. I've now actually, in the last month or so, starting November 1st, I've started posting a YouTube short every day. Oh, sort, nice. of get, sort of to get you know familiar with the format and, and just yeah. try something new. And yeah. it's, it, it's, it's getting a lot of views, which is really interesting because they're just these really short snippets, tips. And um, I guess people like them because they're watching them, right? So oh, yeah, yeah. I, I think that thing also goes back to the attention span because especially on phones, people are used to swiping. So you have yeah, to, yeah, be yeah. Able to capture their attention for 30 yeah. seconds for a minute, yeah. something like that. Yeah. yeah. You're not That's trying great. out TikTok yet? No, no. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> I have never even used it. But I hear it's 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 also like uh, a lot of people yeah. use TikTok. I, I can't I can't picture like tutorials, how to tutorials <laughs> to being like the right for, for TikTok, but maybe they are. I don't know. Yeah. All I hear all I see is stuff my kids forward to me. So <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Hey, okay, I um, wanted to ask you, sorry to yeah. like because you mentioned um do you still do the marathon running like i do morning, yeah you um, wake up at like 5 a.m or something crazy yeah well it's actually really convenient that yes to to push this back for an hour because i had to do i'm actually i actually do triathlons now so i'm training yeah. for a full i'm wow. training for a full distance triathlon wow um, that's crazy so um i had to do an hour and a half bike ride this morning so wow. it really it really actually helped me because now i, I could fit it into my day so wow, wow. Um, that's crazy. yeah yeah that's what I, I i did marathons for a long time and i was like hey you know I, i'm kind of looking for a new challenge i was like i've never done a triathlon before why don't i try wow. doing that wow uh, so yeah and last year was crazy because of so many things being postponed for um because of covid so yeah i had i had a run uh, or a, a series of events last uh, fall where I had a half Ironman one weekend and then I had the yeah. Berlin Marathon the next weekend. 
Wow. And then I had a weekend off and then I had a half marathon and then I had another half Ironman. And then after wow. that, I was completely exhausted. So I didn't do, I didn't do anything for about three months. Wow. Uh, that's crazy. But, but it was fun. You know, I, I, my, the most fun part of it for me is the training and the structure mm. that it gives in my day. Oh, yeah. um, and that's, that's sort of why I went back to working with my coach again, because I needed that structure and it, it just helps me mentally so much and I feel better. And so I think exercise is probably the most fundamental part to me having a fresh mind every day. That's awesome. Um, what, what and time I do, do you like my up? best thinking as well. So <laughs> well, while exercising. Yeah. Yeah. I, you oh, know, it's so cool. Especially what while time do you wake yeah. up? Um, it, de it depends. So today um, I had a call with our team in Australia. So I had to be up early for that, like 6.15, yeah. something like that. But I, yeah. I tend to go to bed very early as well. I'm much more of a morning person to make sure I get enough sleep. Um, yeah, yeah. But I tend to try to do everything in the morning before work starts. Yeah. 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 Also. Um, wow. But yeah. Yeah. But there's a lot more to it than that, though. You know, you have to have a good support system around you and, and people yeah. that are willing to help take on some of the other things. And you have to make some sacrifices. And, you know, I don't go out very much anymore. Um, you know, when I get to a certain point in my training, as I approach a race, I stop, you know, I won't even have a beer. So, mm. um, you know, that's the hardest part, because especially in the <laughs> yeah. UK, you get a lot of peer pressure from people to go out for a beer, yeah, but yeah. I'll just drink non-alcoholic, you know, something. Yeah, like that. yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But that's yeah. so cool. Very inspiring. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I remember talking about this on our podcast. It was really yeah. inspiring. Well, I appreciate all the insights into super data science. Um, mm. It's an unbelievable course, superdatascience.com for anybody that's interested. Thank you. Um, highly recommend it. It's, uh, it's a great learning platform. Do it at your own pace and you'll definitely come out with more knowledge and, and better skills. But I think it's important that we define data science. Mm. So what is data science? How would you define it? Uh, well, I, I would just say data science is... Um, the any activity related to extracting uh, meaningful insights from data. So like I tend to define things more broadly. Mm -hmm. um, and you know like for example, data for to me is um, is not just like the numbers or storage that we have in, in different places. Data is more of like a um, something that exists in the world regardless whether we like it or not, like a, like a, a wind blowing through a tree. Like to me, that generates data. The, whether we're collecting that data or not, that's a different story, you know? So right. data science has um, three main aspects to it. So collection of data, uh, storage of data, and analysis of data. You know, like those things need to happen for you to get those insights on the other side. How you do those things, th that doesn't really matter. Like, but the data as well, it's it's there. And that, I think, to me, opens up my mindset to like when I'm walking outside on the street, when I'm you know thinking about any problem, I know that the data is there. It's being created. It's not, it's not like it doesn't have to be written down in a computer for me to think I can work with it. I know it just exists in the world and it's up to me to go and find a way to collect it. Okay. So this podcast, for example, what we're doing mm. right now, we're collecting data, right? So we're collecting we the words that we speak. We're collecting the amount of time it takes to answer a question or, you know, uh, the inflection of our voices, all that stuff is data. Yeah. Yeah. So how would you take something like that example and yeah. analyze it? Uh, well, it depends on the outcomes you want. So in data science, there's a very rigorous, which I, I think every data scientist should define the process they will follow in data science or data analysts, because data science for me encapsulates analytics, business intelligence, machine learning, all those things. So the, there has to be a process. And for me, that process is a five-step process. First, and the very first step is you have to define the problem. Then you have to, we'll get to the steps later. So first thing is you have to define the problem because if you, um, like w w we have this video, we have the voices, we have the inflections, we have the, the timestamps and so on. But if you just go and like start analyzing right away and you don't have a goal in mind, you'll spend a lot of time. You might get a lot of outcomes, but are they actionable, are they useful insights? So you need okay. to ask yourself, what is the question? Like maybe your question would be like, what's the ratio of uh, who speaks more? You know, is it Kirill? Is it uh, Andy? What's the ratio between the, the talks? Then, you know, like then you need to um, understand how to differentiate between the two different voices. And, uh, you know, like that might be not a super complex algorithm because you don't need to transcribe 
the words and get the meaning out of the words. You just need to, um, you know, get a model for what Kirill's voice sounds like, what Andy's voice sounds like, what silence sounds like or pauses or what, ha what it sounds like when we're talking at the same time. And then you need to just break down your video based on that. So you, you'd write some kind of uh, your own Python um, script or you might get a library to help you out with that. Um, so that would be kind of like a signal processing a library or like a sound processing library. I'm, I'm not an expert on those, but I'm sure they exist out there. There's lots of uh, mm -hmm. libraries that exist out there. So like the very first step would always be to understand um, mm. what, what your question is and then okay. proceed with that. Okay. So you now have the, you know, let's say our question again, back to what you said is who's speaking more? How is that yeah. impacting the yeah. quality of the podcast? Or, well, yeah. quality is a very subjective thing. Um, mm -hmm. So let's say that the question is, you know, who um, who's speaking more? Do mm -hmm. you then go into things like machine learning and AI? Like how do those things, you know, those are terms I hear all the time with data science, like machine learning, AI. Like what mm -hmm. are those and how do those come in to help us solve that problem? Okay, well, let me, before we go to that, let me just quickly, if that's okay, I'll yeah. uh, quickly outline the five steps. So once you know the problem, you would collect and clean the data. For instance, yeah. in this case, it's quite simple. You just have this one source, but sometimes in data science, you have many sources of data and a lot yeah. of them are like not clean or, or, you know, need treatment. So you would collect your data, make sure it's all clean. And that, that's about 70% of the work of a data scientist. Yeah. Then you would analyze and uh, create models, which we'll talk about just now. You would then visualize your data, which is Andy is an expert at, you know, with the, his uh, Tableau teachings. And like I take my hats off to you, how much you taught Tableau, how, you know, the Makeover Monday. Are you still running the Makeover Mondays? Yeah, yeah. I started up again. Uh, well, I, I paused it for about a year and it's back now. Wow. I Like that amount of Makeover Mondays you've done is crazy to me. Like every week, like you're a legend, really, in my in my books. So... <laughs> visualization step four and then step five is presentation i, I outline okay. that step as well because uh a lot of data scientists focus on you know the analysis the visualization but they don't really know how to communicate to non-data science people and that's a very powerful useful valuable skill but back to your question ai machine learning uh data science what what is all of that so um i would look at it like the way the best way to look at it is there's um let's start at the smallest part there's like Oh, no, let's start at the biggest part. So, um, okay, no, the smallest part. Deep learning, that's <laughs> that's like the most narrow uh, like uh, of, of all of these terms. That's okay. like where you create neural networks. It's, you know, you do back propagation. You do like um, uh, RNNs, ANNs, CNNs, whatever it is um, to analyze your data. It's like all, a lot of these black box, al black box algorithms, as we call them. Uh, then if you go out a bit more, then you have machine learning, which encapsulates deep learning. And machine learning... Uh, you know, one area was deep learning, but then there's, you know, things like logistic regression, Bayesian inference, um, classification, clustering, association, rule learning, reinforcement learning. There's a lot of types of machine learning which you can apply, which the usual uh, linear, uh, what's it called, um, simple linear, multiple linear regressions as well. Um, so it's basically when machines look at data and find patterns and learn from that uh, and then be able to apply that to further patterns. Um and then uh, if you go further out, then there's AI, which encapsulates machine learning. And to me, AI, as people will see in the book, the way I decided to define AI for myself is, um, is basically any kind of intelligence that has been man-made. So intelligence is the capacity to make decisions, like a fish can make decisions when to eat, when to sleep, or when to swim. Um, a tree can make decisions which way its roots grow and, you know, like find water. Um, so... Those are natural intelligences and artificial intelligence, like an alarm clock can make a decision when to ring and when not to ring, right? Like a simple, you know, wind up alarm clock. To me, that's artificial intelligence. It's a very simplistic, but yet artificially intelligent creation. A stone or like a rock on a, near a lake is not intelligent in any way. Or I don't know, like a cup that humans create as artificial, but not intelligent. So that's what I define as artificial intelligence. And that's why it's so broad. I like to define things in the broad way. Data science, on the other hand, is kind of like um, it overlaps with artificial intelligence in many ways. Like an alarm clock is not part of data science, but a lot of the algorithms in AI are. So that's what data science to me is. And so um, not always does data science mean 
you have to use AI, machine learning, or deep learning. Data science has other areas that are not part of that Venn diagram where they overlap. So, you know, business intelligence or um, visualization, um, those are all like simple, simple kind of like, um, not like simple just data, data analytics without machine learning. It can also exist. And so maybe in this prep situation, you don't need to create a machine learning algorithm. You don't need to create an algorithm that will learn from patterns that will just, you know, in this stage you do <laughs> because we need to define our voices, right? But on the other hand, you could analyze the video, how you could, you could just watch the whole video and just put the timestamps manually, right? Mm -hmm. That's also a form of data analytics. It's just a manual form of data analytics. So there's lots of ways to solve the problem once you've identified mm -hmm. it. Data science involves and machine learning AI involves lots of models that have to be programmed. Ultimately, yes. those are programmed by humans. Yes. How do we remove somebody's bias from those models? Uh, how do we remove somebody's bias? I guess bias that's, an from that's an ethical concern with AI, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. Um, I I have very limited experience and knowledge about this. I'll answer from what I have heard from other guests I've heard had on the podcast when I was the host, or when you know through mm -hmm. conversations I've had. Um, I would th there are definitely frameworks uh, associated with removing bias, but I think the number one important step is to test for bias so you need to mm -hmm. like how we do um uh, training uh, data and test data for the model itself you should also have uh a like reserved uh, part of your test data uh or reserved part of your data to test the bias so once you've created the model then somebody our specialized algorithm can go through your test bias test data and um like pick out parts of it that would be subject to bias, you know, whether it's race or gender or, you know, whatever else, um, eth ethnicity, what else could it be like affluence, um, uh, postcode where a person lives, mm -hmm. um, uh, how, the, what their name sounds like. Um, and then that would, where bias is likely to occur, that would be put through the algorithm and we would analyze the results. So, uh, unfortunately I can't give you a more in-depth answer to that, but I agree with you. It's a, a big problem that needs to be addressed and uh, looked at and i think the first step is uh, data scientists at least uh, being aware of it and um on a um yeah just like in an ordinary fashion processing their models or checking their models for bias and then how yeah. you address that i guess that's more a case-by-case -case basis yeah okay that that makes complete sense that you need to kind of reserve some of your data to test for the bias i had never heard it explained that way so that makes a lot more sense to me now so thank you for clearing that up My pleasure. we're hearing lots of companies now that are saying oh we need to do data science right because it's like a buzzword yeah. kind of thing yeah. in in your experience are, are companies do they truly need data science or are they just saying it because everybody else is good question uh, like a, a really fantastic question and i can answer this question not just from my opinion but um uh, interestingly from data and not directly from companies but more of a tangential uh analysis we have a team of people not a large team just a few people but who constantly monitor what is uh, happening in the e-learning space and what courses should be released you know so since we create our own courses we started like a publisher model where we invite instructors by the way if anybody's listening uh, is confident as an instructor would like to try them out please feel free to reach out to us um and uh, like they're constantly on the lookout what, what's the next course what is performing well what's what's uh, what are students interested in in what are students are interested in, what are companies interested in like uh, for instance, on Udemy, there's a Udemy business um, division uh, where businesses uh, subscribe to courses. And what we've noticed is in the past uh, three or so years, there has been a significant uh, drop in uh, artificial intelligence, demand for artificial intelligence courses and yeah. to some extent even machine learning courses, but a substantial growth in uh, the demand for um, business intelligence courses. So specifically Power BI, because it's a Microsoft tool, and to a lesser extent, but also uh, Tableau. Um, and we believe that the insight from this is that um, companies 
after this hype, I, I think uh, like a lot of the listeners might be familiar with the Gartner hype curve. If you're not, look it up. It's a very powerful yeah. tool for now analyzing um, how the, the, uh, the magic quadrant. <laughs> yeah, the magic quadrant is the Gartner magic yeah. quadrant, but also they have the yeah. hype curve, which shows like it goes like up, like any technology, whether it's blockchain or AI, okay. it goes up first. There's like a hype around it, then it drops, yeah. and then from there it goes up and it's flat sort of settles, out. right? Yeah. yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And yeah. So, like, what we believe is in like the hype around AI and and data science in like the more general kind of data science, including machine learning was around the 2016, 17, 18 years. And mm -hmm. a lot of companies invested into that, start training staff, building teams, uh, investing you know large budgets into that. And then like they um, lost faith in it when they didn't see the results because you know AI is not uh, is not guaranteed results. Like there are like, you can get results, but you have to be very um, uh, clear on what results you want. you have to have a very, succinct approach you have to have the right technologies the right people it's just a it's a big it's a big undertaking and it's a costly undertaking as well so but business intelligence on the other hand you know has been tried and tested for many years it's been around right. for a long time the tools have just gotten better and so uh, we believe that the companies now like big business and medium business are realizing that hey like the in return on investment on ai can be huge but it's very risky it's not guaranteed whereas business intelligence the return on investment is lower, but it's pretty much guaranteed. You know, you build yeah. a team, you get BI, you get better decisions. Your your management can make better decisions. Let's invest into that. And that's why they're training up more staff and so on. So mm -hmm. um, I guess my advice for anybody who is looking to build a career in data science would be, yes, machine learning. Yes, that's all exciting and interesting. And learn that if you want and if you're excited about it. But also um, add to your toolkit Add, don't forget to add something like business intelligence related, whether it's a Power BI because Microsoft is prevalent in lots of companies and that's the tool they, they choose and it's a pretty good tool. Or it's Tableau and, you know, Andy can teach you all about Tableau. Um, it's, a, it's a great tool and um, it's not hard to learn, right? Like you can learn Tableau and Power BI if you wa really wanted to in a weekend, you could get to like a very foundational level. Like in a month, you could be quite good at it and then learn data science, the rest of data science, because at least this will give you those skills that are in demand right now and will give you confidence in case, you know, like um, you come across a situation where you have to, you need those skills to get a job, for instance. Okay. Sorry, the postman just dropped something through the door. I, <laughs> the bar. That's right. <laughs> I tried to quickly right. put you on mute. It sounds like everything comes back to that first of those five steps that you talked about, though, right? It, it's yeah. what problem are you trying to solve? And That's if you don't right, know yeah. the answer to that question, you shouldn't invest in it, whether it's, yeah. you know, whether it's investing in data science and why do you need data science, or it's, you know, this is a project I need you to work on. If you don't know the question you're trying to answer with that project, don't do it. Right? Yeah, or, that's a good point. Yeah, work, work to refine the scope and and all those sorts of things. Great. So, what is the single most important part of data science? Single most important part of data science. <clears throat> um, that's a good question. Single most important. Well, there's many answers to it. Like, uh, if if we look at it from the perspective we just discussed, then asking the right question. If you ask the wrong question. All, everything you do afterwards makes no sense. If we look at the from the perspective of what, how much time things take, well, the second step, getting and preparing your data, takes about, on average, 70% of the time for, for a data scientist to complete our, our, out of the whole project. So that's super important. But then if we look at the last step, which is presenting your insights, if you've done a great job and you've done all these things amazingly, but you can't communicate your insights or you communicate them inefficiently and effectively or uh, let alone erroneously, then what's the point of all that work? You're actually going to right. do yourself a disservice and, and the business decision maker is going to make the wrong decision, even having the right analytics behind it. So um, I, I really don't know how to answer that question. I think there all are the a above. lot of important... Sorry, all of the above. Yeah, <laughs> all of the above. So the single most important is everything. Everything, yeah. yes. Yeah. yes. Great. Um, so you, you have a huge following on LinkedIn, over 40,000. Uh, I saw that you have, you you can't even take uh, re re connection requests anymore because you've hit some, <laughs> some kind of limit. 
How has yeah. LinkedIn helped you and your business? That's a good question. Um, I think, well, to first to say uh, like 40,000 followers or 30,000 followers uh, a few years ago was a huge following. Now there's, you know, lots of people have 100,000, 120, especially like in the data science space. And I'm, I'm very excited for, for them. So um, like I, I would call my following right now quite moderate and I don't believe I'm doing a good enough job, um, you know, providing um, resources for my following. So I could be doing better in that. Uh, I'm just not a very like social media kind of person in general, but uh, right. it, it was very um, formational um, um, for the business. It helped get spread the word out there and also you know connect with students. But I think the more important question for people listening to um, this podcast is like, what what uh, impact did it have on my career when I was a data scientist? And I can like absolutely clearly and confidently say that it had a massive impact because I remember I was at Deloitte and this one uh, uh, guy, a manager also, his name was Andy, and he came up to me. He's like, Carol, do you have LinkedIn? I'm like, no, well, I don't know if I need it. I'm not a very social person. He's like, no, you should get it. And I looked into it. I created a profile. And uh, I was like, oh, okay. The, it like like it count, It shows your connections up to 500. And after 500, it's like just 500 plus. I'm like, back in yeah. the day, that's how it was. And I'm like, okay, I should get to 500. So I started messaging everybody. Deloitte, getting my profile up, you know, put in like what I knew, like what it was SQL and Tableau and so on, like all these things, asking people to, uh, you know, vet that I, I had those skills. And, and then what I did was I started... Um, like re because I wanted I already knew I wanted a, a new job so at some point I realized I want like I want a new job I was like how do I get a new job probably try through LinkedIn so I started not even creating my own content I was just like reading an article about something data science and then posting it on LinkedIn a link to it and saying here's my opinion about this piece here's my opinion I'm like doing that I even automated that that was happening like three times uh, three times a week. And before you know it, all these people started like listening, following and so on. And, and then recruiters started reaching out to me. You know, mm. like I really believe that this was the case in 2017, 18. I still believe it's the case that data science is a, is a very interesting space because it's so new. More and more companies need data science or business intelligence analysts. But at the same time, a lot more people are also learning it. So there's a, a lot of opportunities, a lot of candidates. But how do you pick out the right ones? How do you pick out the right. good ones? That recruiters are like going mad. Like, how do I fill all these jobs but I can't find the right candidates? Like people are, you know, like maybe not the right fit or maybe not serious enough about it. Where are the good data scientists? So if you make yourself known, even just a simple process like that, just posting articles you read about data science and, and commenting on them, like what happened to me, like recruiters started reaching out to me. And before I knew it, like within a few months, I had three interviews, two with uh, two huge, like two of the big banks in Australia, or big banks in Australia, and uh, one with the pension fund. And like, they were like, just, just couldn't wait to get me on board. And that was like with just like, two, just over two years of experience, you know? So um, um, I think you, LinkedIn is a very powerful tool for mm -hmm. building your career and getting the right connections and opening doors. Yeah. I haven't had a job offer on LinkedIn in like five years. I'm really disappointed by that. But, <laughs> yeah, because my title says like head coach and nobody really knows about me. Right, you're going to be some sports team or something. That yeah, yeah. So I, yeah. I've been thinking about an idea that I'd like to get your opinion on. Um, sure. So the data school can only reach so many people. Yeah. Um, and I recently took a course or over the summer, I took a course by Ali Abdal. I'm not sure if you know who he is on, on no. YouTube, but he has a... Um, a uh, five-week YouTube learning course. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, how to use YouTube better and all these Wow, I need to check that out. That's it's, really cool. It's fantastic. I, I yeah. have a code you can use. Uh, I think Oh, please. Now. Yeah, I'll, I'll just pull up on that. Um, but it, it has really, it has had a structure that worked really well for me. Um, didn't work mm -hmm. as well for other students, but it, but it, um, you have lectures through the week. So there'd be mm -hmm. at least one a day, sometimes two. Yep. And then you had essentially homework and the homework is make a video, right? Yeah. And then you get feedback on that video so that you learn through the five weeks. Um, but the, one of the best parts of that is that it was live. And I've mm. thought about, you know, there's a lot of people that can't leverage what I teach people in the data school. And I was thinking, mm. should I start something like that? Should I start part-time, you know, doing um, a five week course 
that, uh, you know, I, I do a lecture for an hour or something like that every day. And then at the end of five weeks, people have gone through the course and they've, you know, they do homework along the way, whether it's makeover Monday or, you know, I can make exercises up. Do you think something like that would fill is, is there a gap that that would fill? Very interesting. Um, I, I know we're competing with that. you, but you know, but the difference no, no, no. is, is, is I, the I, line, I, you know. Like I, I love competition. I think it's it's always healthy. It's always uh, you know, it just grows the space, you know. Like it's it's yeah. not you know, we're not sharing like uh it's not like a small pie that we have to share, we're just growing the pie together and more people yeah. are coming, more yeah. people are becoming aware of it. Um, I, I don't really have any like very very limited experience with live stuff, like apart from webinars, I, I don't think I've done anything like like what you described. Yeah. But I like the idea, and I think um, people there definitely is a segment like that. That example itself shows that there is a segment of people who, you know, kind of like miss this this uh, there's some some magic, some some beauty to being live. Even it's not in person, but it's yeah. it's at least it's not a pre-recorded course. It's somewhere in the middle. I I think that's that's uh, yeah. something worth trying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cause I'm thinking about like office hours, there could be office hours, but the, the, but the cohort size would only be about like 10 people because once yeah, you yeah, get yeah. beyond that, you can't really have good personal interactions with people. Absolutely. So something I might explore over the, over the Christmas break and see, you know, yeah. uh, I think it entails a lot more than I think it does in the, in my head, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, but it's an idea I'm thinking about because I, you know, I just want to share what I know with more people. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and help more people get better careers than they have right now or that they're unsatisfied with right now. Um, yeah. And there's, we can only help so many people. And there's a lot of people that aren't even eligible to join the data school. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yep. Anyway, uh, thank can you. I for recommend, your... Can I recommend you a book? My book? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, because like, I experimented in the past two years with business quite a lot. And a really cool book for, for ideas like that is called The Lean Startup. And okay. it helps you um, kind of like not to fall in love with your product, but to fall in love with your customers. Like it okay. helps you like develop that idea further, but through an iterative process. Like uh, you develop rather than sitting down and doing developing it for two months and then launching, you develop it for two weeks, you ship it out, the very raw version, you get some feedback from uh, the first users. They, they tell you, oh, we like this, we don't like that. And then you adjust it. And so you kind of like, uh, building on a fly, use it. It basically describes how to use agile uh, methodology in in business, and I found it very useful uh, in terms of like cost saving, time saving, frustration saving, and really taking care of, of the customers rather than just focusing on on a, or like get, being fixated by an idea. Oh, sorry, I can't hear you. You said it's called the Lean Startup. The lean startup, yeah. Okay. I forgot so I'll I'll put a link to that in the in the show notes, and also I'll put a link into your to your book as well, so Thank that you. people can can get that intro to uh, data science. Um, so let's move on to some fun questions. We've we've Yay. talked enough about some serious topics. Um, what does a typical day look like for you, or is there a typical oh, day? What does a typical day look like for me? Um, uh, that's a good question. So, um. About, for about eight months from November last year to about August this year, my typical day was very relaxed. I was doing very minimal work because I burned out for the in the preceding five years working really okay. hard on the course and super data science and so on. And like I got to like uh, uh, like learning about business, failing in many ways. And I was like, I need to take a break for my health. Yeah. So like You're I was waking up late. Sorry, <laughs> your own sabbatical. Your own sabbatical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly like that. I was waking up late, going to the gym. You know, doing. I was exploring music lessons, like singing lessons. I was doing dance classes. You know, like lots of different things, uh, not related to business or data science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then uh, now my typical day looks more like uh, wake up probably around five these days because the sun is just like. In Queensland, we don't have daylight savings. I heard in the U.S. they're going to cancel daylight savings from yeah. next year. Did you know? Yeah, I, I think they're thinking about it. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. Like, we don't have it in Queensland. And the, by 5 a.m., the sun is up so high, you can't yeah. sleep. Like, it's just, like, right in your face. Well, yeah, so, here, here in the U.K., it's, um, it's uh, around 4 in the morning wow. is when it starts That's getting lit. But in the winter, it's the complete opposite. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, so the uh, wake up and then um yeah, like I usually try to have breakfast at work. So I get go to the office as much as soon as I can, work on this secret project we're doing for the land that's launching on first of March. Um and uh yeah. Oh, I always have a nap. I think that will be a, like an interesting uh, mm. thing uh, for your listeners that every day between the hours of 2 and 4 p.m., I have to have at least a 30-minute nap, ideally an hour or maybe an hour and a half. Uh, it's just something like I stopped drinking coffee after Deloitte. So since 2015, I haven't had coffee. Like occasionally I'll have a little bit if I really need it. I use it I use it as a tool rather than as a habitual, you know, right. like a ritual. Um, and so like between 2 and 4 p.m. I'm like, I can't do any mental activity. So so if I have a nap, then like, you so I'm done working mm-hmm. by one, I have lunch, I have my nap. And then in the evening, you know, like I do something else or I work again. Yeah. So that's my typical yeah. day. Okay. Yeah. I, I needed a nap yesterday and it was absolutely glorious. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Good day to work, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, who's been the most influential person in your life? Whoa. Oh. <laughs> <That's creepy. laughs> Yeah. Uh, it's uh day. it's because the like i'm i'm in the office it's it's 9 oh, p.m now it's after hours. automatically turns off yeah yeah yeah. you have to click it to turn it on. yeah sorry what was your question yeah who's been the most influential person in your life ah uh, well i've had lots of mentors throughout the years and for the mm-hmm. listeners i would say it's an important thing to identify when you feel that somebody could be a mentor to actually ask them mm-hmm. to be your mentor and then follow up with them and chase them up with questions um, uh, but you know, if I had to calculate the amount of influence over my life, of course it would be my mom because, you know, like she's recommended a lot of things to me that, you know, somehow she just, she just kind of like feels these things and she tells me and I do them and it works. <laughs> so, you know, like in that way, I would say my mom has been my most influential person. Yeah. And you can always trust a mom to be honest with you as well. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you need that. You need that in a mentor as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You Sometimes to too honest. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what's the biggest regret of your career? And if you go, if you could go back and change it, what would you do? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I would uh, stay with the uh, interview with the vampire, the movie uh, with Brad Pitt and uh, what's his name, Antonio Banderas and Tom Cruise. Uh, like no regrets. Like I honestly can say that i wouldn't change anything even in my career because i'm uh i like i like where i am now and i i just i i value the things i have and by changing a little thing in the back like i don't know maybe it'll cause a butterfly effect and then like i won't have an important person i I value the people i have in my life most of all and i would maybe not have this more an important person in my life and like I, I do wouldn't want that. So yeah, yeah. you don't know where you'd be now if if one little thing changed. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's right. What's the last thing that made you cry? Uh, My last guest said things. he doesn't cry. He's he hasn't cried in probably twenty years. That's so interesting. Wow, yeah. that's yeah. so interesting. Well, like I've been working um, uh, very closely with a psychologist for the past three years. Well, like uh, not weekly, but every two weeks or or several like you know at least uh, once a month um to open up my emotional side because mm-hmm. um i feel like i've been very analytical you know i told you i studied physics and math and i did i went to a high school which was also math focused and like that analytical part i like i played chess a lot that little part of my of my mind is very well developed but i was feeling i was missing some color you know like color in mm-hmm. life and so I, and also, you know, like uh, explore and develop my emotional maturity. And so through that process, I've opened up and I've learned to feel things more often. And um, I think uh, I'd say one of the recent times I cried was probably like a few days ago when I was just sitting and I, I don't remember what it was, but like I was thinking about a person in my life that like, I was like, I don't. Like we, we had a day when we were just running around, like doing something. And I was like, I was, I wasn't focusing on like um, her smile. And I was like, why? Like that day passed and like, I'll never get back. And that, you know, that beautiful yeah. smile. Like if, if these things hadn't happened in my life, I wouldn't have met this person and I wouldn't be 
have the privilege to be spending time and like and i felt like tearing up because of like mm. how grateful i am for for the way life has worked out that i've met you know some you know like this beautiful person in my life or yeah. you know like i have some beautiful people in my life and you know just sometimes i think um even the things we already have in life if you really think about them and not take them for granted then th then that's where crying about like just yeah. out of happiness that you do have mm -hmm. have a life and you know you you have however bad your life is there they can be good good beautiful things that that you you definitely appreciate and value mm -hmm. what about the opposite of that when's the last time you belly laughed belly laughed <laughs> <laughs> when was the last time oh yeah that i don't remember i think yeah i went to i went to an improv show recently um like a few weeks ago and uh, yeah, I was laughing there, like like some stand-up comedy a few months ago or a few weeks ago, an improv show. That was really funny. Um, I think I think I need to laugh more, and I think laughing is healthy. Yeah, yeah. Last question, and this is a question from my previous guest, so you will also yeah. get to leave a question. So you don't know okay. what the question is unless you cheated and looked at the notes. No, no, time. I do. I don't know. I don't know what the question. Okay. Is. So their question was: um, You're stuck on a deserted island. Uh -huh. Which two music albums would you take with you? Oh my god! <laughs> uh, uh, the funny thing is, I I'm not that into music, like like especially. Me water. neither. I, it'd be an impossible question for me to answer. Oh, I'm like <laughs> what what like, um, and like and like when I'm working, I'm not. I'm listening like there's an app, a really cool app called Brain FM, and it's AI generated music that helps you helps your brain focus or relax or whatever mm. you want. It's got like elements of like uh, some repetitiveness. And so um, albums, gosh, um, I, I like, uh, I like uh, cello by Bach. Uh, I think is Bach. I'm not even an expert in classical music, but I like <laughs> yeah, cello. I like yo Yoma. He's got good cello and like cello is kind of relaxing and soothing. I guess I'll take that, but no big preference. <laughs> okay. And what do you want to ask my next guest? Uh, good. I didn't, I was not expecting that at all. What I want to ask, ask your next guest. Um, what would I want to ask your next guest? Um, okay. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, wow. This is hard. This is hard. Um, this is hard. Okay. If you could go back in time, and uh, tell your past self two words only. What would they be? Okay, I'm typing this up as we speak. So if you could go back in time and tell your past self, say that two again. words. Two, two words. words. What would they be? Yeah, I read that somewhere ages ago. And you know what? <laughs> what the funniest answer was? What's that? It was sell Enron. <laughs> sell, sell early yeah <laughs> great well carol thank you very much for for being on today um i really love how many lives super data science has impacted and thanks for taking the time to chat it's great to see you again thanks andy it's it's wonderful to see you and i'm always inspired by the amount of people you're helping and the incredible amount of effort and work you're putting in thank you as well okay. for having me thank you i enjoy doing it